Hello folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard, pastor of Bethel Church in Festus, Missouri and head of prophetic research ministry with a very special edition of the Watchman video broadcast. This is actually the second part of a three-part video series that we're doing based upon Dan Brown's new book, The Lost Symbol. I happen to have a copy of it right here. I read this book from cover to cover, took a lot of notes on it, and people have been asking me what I think about it. Well, I think it's a 500-page brochure for Freemasonry. I think it's an advertisement for Freemasonry. Now, I, I will admit that I've been studying these things, knowing, kind of knowing where Dan Brown was going for a long time. I've been studying these things for several years. And so most of the things that he wrote about in his book didn't catch me off guard, kind of like they did with the Da Vinci Code. So I've been studying this stuff for a while. And uh, I'll tell you that there's a lot of things in here that uh, we, we tried to uncover uh, in the first video called Freemasonry Symbols Reveal. This one, we're going to deal with the structure and the architecture of Washington, D.C., because that's where the story takes place. We learned in the first video that Masons speak in symbols, and that goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 11, and we'll look at that here in just a little bit. But I want you to kind of get this idea about mystery religions, because I think this whole concept of, of a mystery religion and the reality that there are secret groups, there are secret cults, there are religions that operate in secret. In fact, I will go ahead and say that I think that every religion in the world other than true Bible Christianity is a mystery religion. There's always something about it that most people are never going to know, and they're not going to know because it's concealed from them on purpose. Um, but anyway, Masonry is a mystery religion. It is a, you know, the new thing is we used to call them secret societies, and they don't come out and say, oh, we, we're not a secret society. We're a society with secrets. Okay, well then let's reveal what that secret is and let's look at the, the symbols that are in Washington, D.C. Uh, in the last video, we talked about the, what those secrets were. And I'm not going to get into the whole thing. You have to go back and watch the other video. I'm not going to get into... Um you know, the idea of the DNA and the 46 chromosomes and the body is a temple. I mean, you know all that stuff now because you watched the first video. So I'm going to assume that you know that. And if you don't, then stop it right here, put the other DVD in and go back and, and watch it and then come back and pick it up from this point forward. Because we're going to move forward and I'm going to show you some things about the street layout of Washington, D.C., the architecture, the buildings, the monuments. Um, we're going to go right into the heart of D.C. itself and find out exactly uh, uh, what it means. You could almost say that Washington, D.C. is a book without words. It is a Bible without words, but it's not the Bible that you and I are familiar with. It is the Bible, of, it's a secret Bible meant to conceal a secret that will be revealed in due time. Both Masons agree with this, the Rosicrucians, all the secret cults, the New Agers agree with this, but most importantly, the Bible says that all things that are hidden shall be revealed one of these days. By their very definition, Freemasons are builders. They, um, they, they are the offspring of the old stonemasons who built all the big buildings in Europe and the cathedrals in Europe and things like that. But let's go back. In fact, I want to get my Bible out here. Let's go back to all the way to the book of Genesis, chapter 11, and let's discern something, something that God showed me here several years ago um, about Freemasons and about the, the, um, the roots of of their organization. Genesis chapter 11, uh, you remember this is right after the flood, and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Now Shinar is, you've probably heard of um, uh, the Sumerians. That is the land of Shinar. This is the whole uh, area that uh, was Babel and King Nimrod, we find out in Genesis chapter 10. In verse 3, here it is right here. And they said one to another, go to, let us make brick. Now I want you to think about this. What kind of builders build with bricks? Masons. And burned them throughly, and they had brick for stone, and slime they had for mortar. Now you know the whole rest of the story there in Genesis chapter 11. It has to do with the building of the Tower of Babel. Remember that Masons by, by their nature are builders. And so we look at, the, it was Masons who built the Tower of Babel. It was the Masons who built the great pyramids of Egypt. It was stonemasons who built the great cathedrals of Europe. And without question, it was Freemasonry that influenced and directed the building of Washington, D.C. 
Now to start, we're going to go way back in history to a man by the name of John Dee. John Dee was a 16th century occultist and was an advisor to Elizabeth I. Now John Dee was demon-possessed. He was following after what we refer to in the Bible as familiar spirits. John Dee was trying to get in contact. In fact, he claims that he had contact with angels. And through these angels, he had learned a secret language called the Enochian language. And so John Dee was a master of what, what is known in the occult world as Enochian magic. Now, in order to understand what makes Washington, D.C. so special, you kind of need to understand a little bit about this whole New World thing. I mean, here it is in Europe, and you have all these occultists springing up all over the place, the Age of Enlightenment and so on, and you have guys like John Dee and Francis Bacon and, and all these other scientists, pseudoscientists, that were looking into occult things and alchemy and things like that. And uh, all of a sudden, they're hearing that there's this brave new land that's across the ocean somewhere. Uh, it was uh, Francis Bacon, who was a disciple of John Dee, who uh, decided that this was going to be what he referred to as a new Atlantis. Now, Atlantis was uh, this old myth, and I think it had everything to do with the pre-flood generations. Uh, but Atlantis was this whole utopia thing where there was, there was this divine government ruled over by gods and people that had this advanced technology and science was the, uh, was the rule of everything there and there was a great fusion of religion and science together. So all these occultists are thinking about this and they're looking at this new land uh, called America, and they're thinking, you know, that's going to be our new world there. We need a like a a, a new Atlantis capital city uh, to uh, to have as the the center point or the focal point of this new world order that we know is going to come into play. Now, if, just take this concept, new world order, and think about everything that we've learned about Freemasonry in the last video, and what the agenda or what the secret that Freemasons hide. The idea that there is going to be a kingdom that comes to this earth. They are not part of this earth now. They're going to descend down to this earth. Daniel chapter 2 talks about that. And they're going to mingle themselves with the seed of men. And we'll see some of those things in the layout in the buildings of Washington, D.C. But anyway, I just kind of get this whole idea because that's what they're looking for in a city called Washington, D.C. Now, here's they picked this particular location. And this is, this is things that I looked at several years ago. They picked this particular location because at the time of John D., Pope Gregory had come out with a uh with a new calendar. We call it the Gregorian calendar, and uh, everybody uses it today. Well, most everybody uses it today. Uh, but England wasn't going to accept it. John Dee had actually come up with his, his own calendar system, a new way. It was based on the number 33 of all things, but it just never did work, and people didn't like it. And uh, But he thought it was a really good idea. But now remember, he was the advisor to Elizabeth I. And so whatever he would have told Elizabeth I, that's what she would have done. Originally, John Dee was not going to go along with this Gregorian calendar. But he scratched his head and got his ink and paper out and started doing some figuring and ciphering and things like that. And he was looking at the map of the new world and looking at how things lay. And he realized, and I don't know how he figured this out, but he realized and it dawned on him that the vernal equinox or the spring equinox, which is real special to uh, the occultists and Freemasonry, and we learned about that in the last video, uh, because the vernal equinox and the, and the fall equinox have to to do with equilibrium or equality or things that have balance. And if you remember the symbolism of that, that is two things fused together or two kingdoms fused together. And so that's what the equinoxes represent. John Dee realized that there was one place in the world, one line of, of longitude in the world where on March the 21st, now I'll tell you why that particular date in a minute, but on March 21st, uh, John D. realized that in, in a certain location, which we now know is the 77th meridian, we'll talk about that number here, uh, he realized that at that particular place, was on March 21st was when the vernal equinox occurred and you had exactly 12 hours in the day and 12 hours in the night. And so he is the one that laid the number one, the acceptance for the Gregorian calendar because it, it put the vernal equinox on March 21st and in this particular place, which we now know as Washington, D.C., the vernal equinox occurred giving you 12 hours in the day and 12 hours in the night. Now, 
The reason why March 21st, I believe, is so significant is that it has a number attached to it. Uh, number one is in the third month, and the number three is always sacred and special to Freemasonry. It's the, the number for death and resurrection, but it, uh, as we now know, it's the number for the triple helix, which is the adding of a third strand to man's two-strand DNA. But another reason why they chose uh, March 21st and its significance is because it's the 80th day of the normal calendar year. Now, when you have a leap year, that kind of throws it off a little bit. But in, in most years, the 80th day of the calendar year is March 21st. Now, this brings us to the the specialism or the special significance of the number eight. And for our understanding of the number eight, we go to the scriptures. We're not going to look at the occult or anything like that. Let's go to the scriptures and find out exactly what the number eight means. Revelation chapter 17, verse 10. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. And so we know that Masons and the occultists, the New Agers, the Wiccans, they all use numbers or numerology and to, the, and to them those things are are sacred. And so everything that they do is always going to follow some sort of geometric pattern or some sort of numerical pattern. And oftentimes the geometry and the numerics go hand in hand. They're never separated from each other. So the 80th day of the year was chosen, March 21st. The location was pinpointed the 77th meridian, and so now we have a place. The number eight is also associated in the occult world. It's, uh, you see the number eight is related to the infinity symbol. The infinity symbol is a, is a picture of uh, man becoming a god, which is the whole purpose of Freemasonry. The infinity symbol also shows the fusion of two things together, or the fusion of two worlds together. Do you remember September 11, 2001, when the World Trade Towers collapsed? And we got a few more things to say about that. But on that day, after the towers collapsed, they erected two towers of light. And each one of those lights had 44 bulbs in them, giving you a total of 88. That number is significant to them. And by the way, those, those lights remained lit for exactly 33 Nights. You're starting to get a clue here. But let's talk about the number 77 and why that particular number uh, was used. It was anticipated that the, um, the new federal city or this new utopia or this new Atlantis, Washington, D.C., it was anticipated that um, it was going to be the center point of a new prime meridian on the earth. Now this takes us back to Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code. You remember in The Da Vinci Code, Dan Brown talked about a, a, the, the uh, prime meridian, which is, which is longitude zero, being in, used to be in Paris, France. He called it the Rose Line because it symbolized the alleged bloodline between Jesus and Mary Magdalene. Now we know that that refers to something else. The sons of God, daughters of men, mingled together and their offspring, which is the whole focus of the secret of Freemasonry. It was a veiled reference to the offspring of Osiris and Isis, whose name was Horus. You see here on one of the earlier maps of Washington, D.C., that it was anticipated that the federal city, or Washington, D.C., right down the middle of it, would be longitude zero or a new prime meridian. Now, there for a while, all these cities were clamoring for uh, being the location of the prime meridian. Paris wanted it, the United States wanted it, but it was finally decided that Greenwich, England would be the location for the new prime meridian, which, you know, was no big deal to everybody because then it placed the federal city, or Washington, D.C., upon longitude 77. Now, the significance of this particular number is going to be seen in the pages of the scripture. It has everything to do, remember, we, uh, we're talking about from the Da Vinci Code how the longitude of the meridian line was a symbol of the rose line or the supposed lineage of Jesus Christ. And so now we have the capital city, Utopia, sitting on longitude 77. What significance does this number play as far as the lineage or the offspring or the birth of Jesus Christ. Let's go to the book of Luke chapter 3. In Luke chapter 3 verse 23, the Bible says, And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being as he was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Heli. And if we move all the way down, that gives, the Bible gives a whole lineage here, and we move all the way down to Luke chapter 3 verse 38. 
The Bible says, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. So if you, if you do what I did, and that is you go to your Bible and you count from Jesus to God here in Luke chapter 3, you'll have a total of 77 names in the lineage that produced Jesus Christ. So I want you to get this in your mind because that number is significant to them. So here we have the capital city and what we're going to see in this video is all of these sculptures and images and street layouts, they all point to the dawning of a new age and a new world and the birth of a new Christ on the earth. So the number 77 being about the production or the coming of the Messiah on the earth. So here we have a utopia city built on longitude 77. Now, let me give you a little sideline information to kind of show you how this works. Do you remember on September 11th, uh, 2001, not only did we have the Twin Towers fall, which I believe were a picture of the two pillars of Freemasonry, Jacob and Boaz, being destroyed so that a new one could come up in its place. Go back to the first video and get information on that. But the Pentagon also was destroyed. Now, some people say it was a plane. Some say it was a missile. I don't know what it was, but I know that there was a, I know the Pentagon was the target uh, this particular scenario that played out on September 11th, 2001, we're going to see more about it. But do you know how tall the Pentagon building is? It's exactly 77 feet tall. Do you remember what flight it was that flew into the side of the Pentagon building? Well, it was Flight 77. In Texas, there's a highway called Highway 77. Now, this highway goes through Waco, Texas. Do you remember back years ago, the, the Branch Davidian compound that was... That was uh, burnt down to the ground, and David Koresh, that Branch Davidian compound was near Waco, Texas. Waco, Texas is on Highway 77. By the way, guess how old David Koresh was? He was 33 years old. Highway 77 goes northward into Dallas, Texas. In fact, in fact, Elm Street, you remember the whole thing about Dealey Plaza where John F. Kennedy was, was assassinated? On the 11th month, the 22nd day, let's see, that's a number 33 as well. But these three streets that make up Dealey Plaza go into what's called the Triple Underpass, and they'll head and intersect right at Highway 77. Highway 77 then goes northward into Oklahoma City, where you find the Alfred P. Murrah building. Alfred P. Murrah was a 33rd degree Freemason, supposedly bombed by Tim McVeigh, and Tim McVeigh was executed Guess how old he was? He wasn't 77. He was 33 years old. Now let's look at a tale of two cities. One is called Heavenly Jerusalem. The other city is called Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. Now these represent the two opposites that you see all the time in the scriptures. Um, you have, and, and by the way, let me say this. The word city in the King James Bible is found in exactly 777 verses of the Bible. Now that's interesting because here we have a guy that we're going to talk about in the next video by the name of Aleister Crowley. Aleister Crowley happened to write a book called 777 and other Kabbalistic writings of Aleister Crowley. This book was all about the Kabbalah, which is about the divine man and numerology. But, you know, let's hook the train back up again, and let's talk about these two cities for a minute. Let's get a biblical explanation of them both. First, let's talk about heavenly Jerusalem, which... That's where I want to be one of these days. Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 3. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The opposite of that would be a new world order. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Now this verse shows you that God already has a plan for man's eternity. And that is that at some point, and, and, and we believe that after the millennial reign of Christ occurs, that God is going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And now heaven and earth are going to be joined together or bridged together without sin. It will be the utopia that all these occultists keep wanting. But heaven and earth will be joined together 
by a new city called New Jerusalem. It is pictured as a beautiful bride adorned for her husband, a virgin bride who is prepared for the, the great wedding of Christ in his church. And what a glory that's going to be. But then we have another city that would be its exact opposite. Heavenly Jerusalem comes from heaven down to earth, and it's a virgin bride. This other city called Babel is a harlot city that seeks to go from earth to heaven. Let's look at Genesis chapter 10 to find the builder of this new city. Genesis chapter 10 verse 8, And Cush begat Nimrod. Remember, Cush was of the cursed lineage of Ham. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. Some say that he was actually a giant. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Echad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. So if you've heard a lot of stories about the Sumerians and about all some of these things about giants and the Anunnaki and all this stuff, which you ought not believe, you ought to just believe the biblical account of it and you'll be okay. Uh, but Nimrod was the one who established the first kingdoms on the earth. And he built a town or a city called Babel. Then we go back to Genesis chapter 11. Let's look at this verse again. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So remember, God has a city that descends from heaven down to earth. God himself is going to bridge the gap between he and mankind. Mankind, however, led by Lucifer, has a different plan. That is not to let God descend down, but to try to elevate man upward. And so they're going to build a tower, a city and a tower, whose top may reach into heaven. That plan is still in existence today. Here is a graphic of an artist's depiction of the Tower of Babel. And here is a photograph of the European Union Parliament building. It is the new Tower of Babel. Now, what we're going to focus on in this video is the fact that I believe that Washington, D.C. was intended to be the capital city, not just of America, but of a new world order. And remember, what better place to build a new world order than in the new world? So here this new land was chosen, uh, and this street was laid out. Now you look at an aerial picture or a map of Washington, D.C., and you see all these lines intersecting all over the place. This was because Washington, D.C. was laid out on the basis of what's called sacred geometry. Sacred geometry is one of those things. This, there's another term for it called geomancy. It's, a, it's an effort to use divination or to send a secret message by way of locations or symbols or lines that are upon the earth. Some people refer to them as ley lines. And they believe that these lines and these buildings and these monuments all have this special significant power that will uh, bring in or usher in a new world. It's kind of like, you remember that movie, The Field of Dreams, where, uh, you know, Kevin Costner kept hearing that thing in his ear, you know, if you build it, they will come. That's kind of the concept behind Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. was built more or less as an invitation uh, to this new world order that is going to be established based upon Daniel's fourth kingdom mentioned in Daniel chapter 2. Now the thing about all these intersecting lines and the street layouts and the map and things like that, that if you're walking the streets of Washington, D.C., you're driving through them, uh, none of these things really make sense. They only make sense when they're viewed from above. Most people for years who never saw a map of Washington, D.C. didn't know that there was a pentagram there. And we'll see that here in just a little bit. Uh, but it's amazing what we're finding out now. Now that we have the ability to fly over, or use satellites, Google Earth, uh, to see these things firsthand. Not just look at them on a map, but to see these things firsthand. It's sort of like, remember when the Nazca lines were discovered. Here you had all these intersecting lines and images and things like that that nobody saw for years until a guy flew over from an airplane and said, what in the world is that? And there have been scientists and conspiracy people that have speculated about what the meanings of these things are, but the truth of it is these things only make sense from above. Here you have Stonehenge, the images on Easter Island. 
the Great Pyramids, which happen to align with the three stars in Orion's belt. These things, I think, are meant to be like an invitation or a concept that says, bring it on, we're ready for a new world order. Now let's get back to Washington, D.C. As we mentioned a while ago, the first thing that stands out in your mind is that there's this big giant pentagram built into the street layout of Washington, D.C. If you remember from Dan Brown's earlier book, The Da Vinci Code, uh, the pentagram is a symbol for what he referred to as the sacred feminine, or that women are goddesses uh, because of their ability to procreate and produce life. And so Dan Brown used that concept of the sacred feminine in his book, The Da Vinci Code, and he tells you, and this is actually true, that the, the pentagram or the symbol of the pentagram is based upon what's called the Venus transit. The planet Venus in our skies, which we a lot of times refer to as the morning star, but sometimes it rises in the morning, sometimes it rises in the evening. And over an eight year period, uh, astronomers began to realize that the planet Venus will actually draw a five pointed star or a pentagram uh, in the sky. And it, like I said, it takes eight years to do this. The interesting thing about the planet Venus though, is that during this eight year cycle, when it's drawing this big pentagram, pentagram in the sky is that it revolves around the sun exactly 13 times. Now this gives us an occult connection with the city of Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. And the reason why I'm saying that is in your King James Bible you will see in Revelation chapter 17 that the name of the woman, now remember we're talking about two cities here. We're talking about heavenly Jerusalem which is the virgin bride of Jesus Christ and we're talking about Mystery Babylon the Great which is a harlot woman and she is the wife of the beast. She is riding the beast. Revelation chapter 7. Uh, excuse me, Revelation chapter 17. But in your King James Bible, you will note that this woman has a name written on her forehead. And in all capital letters, you find the name Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. A 13 word title. The number 13 in the Bible has to do with the love of God. The great charity chapter in the Bible is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The phrase love of God is mentioned 13 times in the King James Bible. But you also have, that's God's pure love. Harlot love is the exact opposite of pure love. Remember the two opposites that we're dealing with here. The number 13 is also a sacred number in the occult and in Freemasonry. In the York Rite of Freemasonry there are 13 levels. If we look at the mural of George Washington in the Capitol Rotunda, we find that George Washington is surrounded by 13 goddesses. Those goddesses are representatives of Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. When we look a little bit closer at this mural, we find that the image of George Washington, which we're going to talk about later, is surrounded by 72 stars or 72 pentagrams. The number 72 is a veiled reference to the pentagram. There are exactly 72 degrees in the exterior angles of a regular pentagram. And in the Kabbalah, which is Jewish mysticism, the Kabbalah is everything that God told the Israelites not to learn from the Canaanites and the Hittites that they went ahead and learned. And they fused it together into, uh, into what they knew about Jehovah. And it's, it was the Jewish form of the mystery religion. The Kabbalah plays heavily into the concepts of Freemasonry. In the Kabbalah, there are 72 names of God. So now you understand that the number 72 is a veiled reference for the pentagram. And the pentagram itself is a symbol for, as Dan Brown pointed out, the sacred feminine, um, the concept of Venus, and it specifically references the morning star. In Manley Hall's book, The Secret Teachings of All Ages, he teaches you that in the Great Seal of the United States of America, the Unfinished Pyramid, there are exactly 72 stones in there. In the National Archives building, you remember that's where the secret map was located uh, in the movie National Treasure. In the National Archives building, that building is surrounded by 72 pillars. Now back to this pentagram. When you look at the aerial view of the street layout of Washington, D.C., I mean, you obviously see a pentagram there. And, and it's been noted by some uh, Masonic authorities that this is not really a pentagram because there's like one part of it missing. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute because it's very in interesting what we found out about this. But anyway, the apex of this pentagram just happens to be the White House, you know, where the President of the United States lives and does all of his, his work there. Exactly 13 blocks north of the White House. And here's that number 13 connection with the pentagram. Exactly 13 blocks north 
is the Masonic House of the Temple Lodge in Washington, D.C. Now, it's like I said before, it was noted by certain Masonic authorities who ridicule this idea that people see a pentagram there and they say, no, you don't, that's crazy, you don't see anything like that there, is that it's not a pentagram. They say it's not a pentagram because there's like one piece of it missing. Let's go back to the authorities that Dan Brown based his book, uh, The Lost Symbol, on. One of those was Manley P. Hall, who wrote a book called The Secret Teachings of All Ages. Here's what Manley Hall said about this particular pentagram. He said, the pentagram is the figure of the microcosm, the magical formula of man. It is the one rising out of the four. The four here that he's talking about would be the four base pairs of your DNA, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thiamine, joining together to make the DNA ladder. Remember, the concept is, is that they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, which means that they will add something to man's DNA. So here you have a figure that represents the number four with something else added to it. That is the nature of the pentagram. He says it is the one rising out of the four, the human soul rising from the bondage of the animal nature. It is the true light, the star of the morning. It marks the location of five mysterious centers of force, the awakening of which is the supreme secret of white magic. Now he mentioned in this, and this, this is what really gets me, he mentioned in here the star of the morning. That is a variant of what we see in the King James Bible concerning Lucifer. You know who Lucifer is. He is the dragon, the devil, that old serpent, the deceiver of mankind. He is the one who wants to sit on God's throne and have everybody worship him. And that plan is seen in Isaiah chapter 14 beginning in verse 12. Lucifer is the fallen angel. And what we see in the image of the pentagram, we see a number. That number is the number five. And so here in Isaiah chapter 14, we see Lucifer's five-point plan. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, Number one, I will ascend into heaven. Number two, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Number three, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Number four, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And number five, I will be like the Most High. His plan is to ascend into heaven and sit in the throne that God currently sits on right now. That is the meaning, the real true meaning behind the pentagram. So here we have, remember our concept of two cities now. We have heavenly Jerusalem and we have Mystery Babylon the Great. Mystery Babylon the Great wants to ascend. She wants to rise up. Her symbol then is the pentagram because it represents the plan of Lucifer to take over the authority away from God in heaven.